Hi everyone. Okay, so there have been plenty of issues raised regarding some of the things I said in Dr. Liar Part 4. I know, I probably didn't explain things well enough for all the members of my audience to follow and I apologize for that. Sometimes, you know, you have to draw a balance between keeping the video reasonably short and giving thorough explanations, I guess. Well, I goofed a little, so um, I've been getting plenty of comments about the same things over and over again, so it's time I made a video to actually address these issues. Here we go. If you haven't watched the original video, here's the context. Jason Lyle claims that light travels at 0.5c away from the observer and at infinite speed toward the observer. That makes the average round trip speed c, which is consistent with all observations. This can't be proven wrong, he says, and even Einstein agreed that the one-way speed of light is merely a convention. We agree to treat it as being c in both directions, but we could just as easily agree to use Lyell's convention. This is absolutely correct. The problem isn't that what Lyell is saying is false. It's that it would require rewriting lots of well-established physics in a way that makes it much more complicated, but for no reason. Oh, except that it allows for the Bible to be literally true. If you ignore the fact that the distant starlight problem isn't exactly the only thing that disproves it. Actually, as I showed, accepting Lyle's idea would result in physics, at least for now, losing the ability to explain certain things, such as the existence of the particle horizon and the young appearance of distant galaxies. But I stand by what I said, there is no experiment that could falsify Lyle's convention, because it's a convention and not a hypothesis about the true nature of light. Now, the first problem people seem to have is that if you have two observers bouncing light between them, it should travel instantly in both directions, because in both directions it's heading toward an observer, right? Thus, the round trip speed is infinite and not c, and that's something that should most definitely be possible to confirm experimentally. So that falsifies Lyle's convention, right? No, this is a misunderstanding of what Lyle actually proposes. Say that observers A and B bounce light between them. It doesn't matter if they're emitting pulses of their own or if they're reflecting the same pulse with mirrors. All that matters is that light is going back and forth between them. A and B are, for the sake of simplicity, one light second apart, by which I mean it takes one second to make the trip from one to the other at C. In A's frame of reference, A is the observer, so according to him, going by Lyle's convention, it takes two seconds for A's light pulse to reach B. It then takes zero seconds for B's pulse to reach A. Total round trip time, two seconds. In B's frame, A's pulse takes zero seconds to reach B, and then it takes two seconds for B's pulse to reach A. Again, the total round trip time is two seconds. In no frame of reference will it take 2 plus 2 equals 4 seconds, or 0 plus 0 equals 0 seconds. And that's the key to all of this. If the one-way speed of light is relative, and I reiterate there's no reason to think it is, and choosing to treat it as such only makes physics a lot more complicated than it needs to be, then A and B can disagree about how the event unfolds. What they cannot disagree about is the round trip speed, which, in order for this to remain unfalsifiable, must be the same as if Einstein's second postulate held true. That is, that in a vacuum, light always travels at C according to every inertial observer. What this all comes down to is the relativity of simultaneity. Say that a light source halfway between A and B emits a pulse. The way we think of it, it takes 0.5 seconds for both A and B to light up, and it then takes another second before they see the other being illuminated. What A observes is that suddenly and without any advance warning, a light pulse from some distant source hits him, and one second later he sees B being lit up. As far as A is concerned, it really does appear that the light traveled instantly from the source to A, because A only learns that the pulse has been emitted when he's hit by it. Prior to this, there was no experiment A could perform that could reveal that the light had been emitted, so in the observable physical reality of A, it hadn't been. We can indicate this with lines of simultaneity. Events along these lines occur simultaneously according to A. 
Of course, B sees the same thing, but in reverse. B is lit up, and one second later, he sees A being lit up. Now, the interesting thing is that we think we know what really happened. But the point is that in order to say that, we have to assume that light has traveled at C in both directions. What observer experiences events according to the white lines of simultaneity? The light source? Nope. According to the light source, A and B both light up after one second, because light has to reach them and return before the source can see it. It turns out that no one experiences things according to the white lines. In no frame of reference do things actually occur that way. What we intuitively think of as the actual sequence of events is actually just a construct without physical significance. And since no observer can measure the one-way speed of light, that turns out to be part of that physically insignificant construct. The one-way speed of light will never matter, so just set it to C in accordance with Maxwell's equations, making all other equations as simple as possible since we don't have to worry about which direction the light is traveling, and call it a day. Everyone's happy except some idiot who complains that this means that distant starlight proves that the universe is more than 6,000 years old, which we already know it is anyway. Now let's move on and look at some ideas people have had regarding how to measure the one-way speed of light, including one method that I can only assume is the result of a brain fart. Just use a stopwatch. Start it when the source emits the light pulse and stop it when the pulse hits the target a known distance away. The problem should be obvious, but apparently brain farts happen, so here it is. How do you know when these events occur? Light has to reach you in order for you to know when either event occurs. So to compensate for the travel time to you, you have to know the one-way speed of light in the direction from either event to you. But that's the point, we'd have to know the one-way speed of light in order to measure it. So what we need to do is eliminate the effect of the travel time we're not interested in. And to do that, we set it up so that the source emits light at a certain time, say t. Great, I'll stop my clock when I receive the pulse. If it says, say, t plus 1, I'll know it took one second to travel the distance. Measure the distance and boom, speed equals distance over time. Done, right? Well, no. In order for this to work, the two clocks must be perfectly synchronized. And how are you going to synchronize them? Here's a thought. Send a signal from one to the other saying, it's t o'clock. That means the other clock can now set itself to t, plus the time it took for the signal to reach it. Oh, wait, we don't know that, because that's what we're trying to find out. Oops. Okay, next idea. Synchronize the clocks in the same place and then move them into position. Well, it turns out that doesn't work either, because movement will result in time dilation. One of the weird things that happen in relativity is that time slows down when you move. The effect is usually negligible, but here the clocks need to be exactly synchronized because light is very fast. We could compensate by calculating the amount of time dilation, of course, but to do that you have to know the speed of light in the direction of motion, and that's what you're trying to determine, so yeah. Again, oops. Okay, so new idea. Both the source and the receiver look at the same clock a known distance away. And to eliminate the problem of having to know the travel time, let's make that clock equidistant from both of them. Great! Now it takes light just as long to reach one as the other. Assuming, of course, that light has the same speed in all directions. Damn it! Another method that's been suggested is to use GPS, which assumes that light travels at the same speed in all directions. And it works! Well, great! So we're done, right? Well, no, because the clocks on the satellites and the receivers are synchronized according to Einstein's convention. If we synchronized them according to Lyell's convention and used the same convention when calculating the receiver's position, the result would still be the same. This fact, that the two versions of the same theory make the same testable predictions, is what makes it impossible to test which one is correct. Therefore, it's not a question of which is more correct, but which is 
better. Einstein's version is both simpler and explains more. That makes it better. But I understand that this bothers a lot of people. I think a lot of skeptics don't want to accept that the one-way speed of light is just a convention because we want evidence before we accept something. And now here I am saying that this thing you accept is unprovable? Well, I must be wrong. Scientists must have evidence for this because they wouldn't accept it otherwise. But no, they don't have evidence. And yes, they do accept it as a convention. It's okay to do this because it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. Because it can't be tested, there's not even a meaningful way to talk about right and wrong in this context. Choosing the one-way speed of light is like choosing whether to use metric or imperial units. I can give you plenty of reasons why I think metric is better, but that doesn't mean that using imperial units is wrong. You'll still end up making the same predictions. The problem isn't that Lyle's model is wrong, it's that it's not even a model, it's just a convention, and that's the ultimate reason why it can't solve the problem Lyle claims that it solves. It's like he's trying to cross a 10 meter gap with a 6 meter bridge by choosing a gap measuring convention whereby you measure a gap not from edge to edge, but from center to edge. Sure, you can use that convention, but sorry, no choice of gap measuring convention will make the bridge reach across the gap. It doesn't fail to reach across because we choose to measure gaps from edge to edge. It fails because it's too short. In the same manner, no choice of the one-way speed of light can affect the fact that distant galaxies appear young or the existence of cosmological redshift, or the particle horizon, or the complete absence of any known mechanism that would allow for the speed of light and vacuum to vary depending on direction. And these things are all beautifully explained by models in which the one-way speed of light is assumed to be C. It's not the convention that explains these things, but the models that employ it. That makes the convention useful just like it's useful to measure gaps from edge to edge. All Lyle has to offer is that while a model that uses his convention isn't well grounded in Maxwell's equations, has less explanatory power and makes the math needlessly complicated, it is compatible with a fairy tale that says that snakes can talk, the earth is flat and those distant stars he has such a problem with. They're actually inside what we today call the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna stick to using Einstein's convention. It seems less, you know, stupid. See ya.